Good afternoon. We're going to get started here. Thank you guys for coming to another week of Capital Clarity. We have Dr. Ryan Cole here to speak today. Um, he's going to talk to us about children, COVID, schools, and possibly a mandatory vaccine. So. Thank you. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you to the Lieutenant Governor's Office again for inviting me. Um, as uh, Beth said, I'm Dr. Ryan Cole. I'm board certified Mayo Clinic trained pathologist. Uh, been in practice for 17 years, 18 years, 18 years here in Idaho. Okay, I'll, I'll try to get closer to the microphone this time. It's a little soft today. So anyway, I've been uh, here in Idaho for 18 years. Uh, between my wife and I, we've lived in 13 states. So kind of an all-American boy here, just grateful to live in Idaho. Um, by uh, way of disclaimer, next slide please there. Um, uh, disclosure, somebody asked me last time, I have a small interest in a rapid uh, COVID vac or antigen test uh, that's in regulatory uh, um, process right now. It's one of the most uh, sensitive on the market. It's a 10 minute at home uh, test also my own company, and also by disclosure, I'm, I'm an independent, unaffiliated with any political party, any organization, any foundation. I am just an independent, free thinking, that's who I am as a person. I, I'm here to speak data, I'm here to speak science. Some people may have some confirmation bias uh, towards some things I say, some may have bias against it, that's fine. You know, what I hope for, after I spoke uh, last time, you know, I had some positive feedback, I had some negative things, it's fine in our society to disagree, and we need civil discourse. And if you disagree with anything I share here today, this is from scientific data. If you throw dirt in life, you lose ground. So if, if you want to have a conversation, let's have a civil conversation. Invite me to lunch or coffee, let's sit down, share data together. What we're all in this for is to save lives and make a difference in what's happening and improve our societal condition. That's who I am as a person. We're in this together to save lives, make a difference, and make this world a better place. So that stated, I'll get going here. All right, let's talk about some good news today. Let's talk about our children. Children in COVID, it's been an interesting year for all of us. But importantly, now that we can do a retrospective look, children and young people remain at low risk for COVID mortality. You have. Um, out of 74 million children in the United States, age 0 to 18, there have been 226 deaths this year as of yesterday. Every death is a tragedy. That's sad. It hurts us in our hearts. I know that. The same amount uh, die or more from the flu every year. Um, this year, there have been 178 deaths from the flu in children. All cause deaths in children this year have been over 37,000. So the risk factors for these children that have passed away are identical to those risk factors for adults. We know that those who pass from COVID on average have 2.6 comorbidities. So heart disease, obesity, cancer, diabetes, genetic disorders, those risks that unfortunately these children have passed from are the same. So if you look at the children in the United States, 99.9997% of children in the United States did not die this year from COVID. That's encouraging. That's good news. That's how we should be reporting statistics. Look how well we're doing. That's fantastic. Yay. All right. Why are these kiddos doing so well? Little children are not, are not little adults. Their immune systems are different than ours. See, when they're in schools, when they're together, how many parents in the room? Probably a lot. I have six daughters. Children, you know, they go and they, they live in their little petri dishes of school and preschool and they share their germs around. And that's how you build an immune system. You eat dirt, you play in the mud, you play with cats and puppies and et cetera, et cetera. An immune system, in order to be strong, if you sit in a chair for three weeks straight and try to stand up and jog around the block, your muscles are wasted and weak. If you don't tune your immune system, it is wasted and weak. We need to be exposed. Well, children have, we, we hear a lot in the news about antibodies, 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 I need to build up my antibodies. 
Antibodies are a memory to something that may come along in the future. What you really want is a strong, immediate response. That's your innate immune system. And your innate immune system is mostly your T cells and a type of cell called a natural killer cell. And so I like to make the comparison that your natural killer cells, they go around your body, they shake hands with every cell in your body all day long, friend or foe, friend or foe, infected, not infected, infected, not infected. Children have two to three times these cells as adults. The older we get, these numbers wane. Inside these little cells, they have two little enzymes, one called a perforin and one called a granzyme. And so they shake hands, and if a cell is infected, they poke a hole with that perforin, they perforate it, and then they throw a granzyme in it, a little grenade, blow that cell up, get the infection out of the way, it gets mopped up. So we want a strong innate immune system. Your natural killer innate immunity is essentially your soldiers with bazookas and grenades. Your antibodies are more a maid with a broom and a plumber with a wrench. That's, that's down the road. When you get infected, that's the after effect starting to you know, present long-term immunity. You want a strong innate immune system, and this is why children are doing so well. They see something, their body goes, we can get rid of that. We can get rid of that. So with COVID, a lot of us, Every year, uh, COVID can be anywhere from, or not, uh, coronaviruses, alpha coronaviruses can be five to 10% or even 20% of the common cold. A lot of us already have this cross T cell memory and immunity to coronaviruses. So some studies show, look, 30 to 50% of our uh, populations in some studies uh, already have innate memory to COVID-19 because we've had common colds that have been coronaviruses. In the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, 70 to 80 percent of people already had this innate T cell memory to COVID-19. Even though it wasn't COVID-19, it was a coronavirus. And our bodies, this natural, innate, you know, soldier with a grenade, boom. And that's why so many people are doing so well, especially the kiddos. All right, what's a case of COVID? This has been controversial. Because we can detect it, is it a case? Um, in this room, 90 to 95% of you have mononucleosis, Epstein-Barr virus. 95% of you have CMV virus. Probably 95% of you have shingles, strep throat, yeast infections. In the laboratory, through a very sensitive test, I could detect that. But if you don't have a symptom, how many of you have shingles right now? Probably very few. Because you have the virus, does that mean you are a case of shingles? No, you're not a case of shingles. Because you're carrying the monovirus in your body, does it mean you have mono right now? No, it does not. Why don't you have it right now, even though you have that virus in you? Because your innate T cell memory immune system is keeping it at bay. Same thing, cancer cells every day in our body, a malignant cell or two. These T cells come along, shake it, shake hands with it, oh, foe, blow it up. So. If we look at these numbers and these curves, what's truly a case versus virus detected? So that's something important to think about, how we're defining things. Because in medicine, we usually define a case as someone with symptoms with a, with a pathogen. OK, asymptomatic spread. In Wuhan, they did a 10 million person study. They found 300 that tested positive that were asymptomatic. And in their asymptomatic spread, you've heard a lot about asymptomatic spread, asymptomatic spread. Well, in their study, they showed out of 300 that tested positive with no symptoms, of 1,174 close contacts with those 300 people, there was zero transmission. A very big meta-analysis from the University of Florida, University of Washington, looked at 54 studies from around the world. The lack of observed transmission from observed asymptomatic index cases is notable the peak of transmission is at symptom onset. All right. Next. All right, schools, more good news, more good news. The world famous SIDRAP in the University of Minnesota, Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, they looked at studies from North Carolina, a very big study, a study from Norway, a study from Sweden. They concluded it is better to adjust infection prevention and protocols according to community transmission levels than to close our schools. Children, especially age zero to 10, are not a significant factor in the spread of COVID-19. That was a five country study in the world famous journal, The Lancet. It is far more important 
to note it is more likely that parents transmit to children than the other way around. It is unlikely that children have boosted this pandemic in any way. That's from a JAMA study in Germany. So children in a classroom are, are not very likely to spread it child to child according to these studies and far less likely to spread it child to teacher. It would generally be the other way around. Am I saying let's not do surveillance? No, if we need to do surveillance, sure. We can still be prudent as you know, we decrease our fear and anxiety and move forward with, with prudence. All right, saving lives. You know, there are three things in the history of humanity that have saved more lives than anything. Public health, sanitation, and clean water has probably saved the most lives on the planet Earth. Antibiotics in the antibiotic era. And number three, vaccines. I'm not anti-vaccines. I am very pro-approved, safety-proven vaccines. I got criticized recently. That's fine. If you have a question, talk to me personally. Don't throw <laughs> epithets. Let's be honest. I am pro-safe vaccine. All right, what about vaccines in children? Okay, let's go to the CDC definition. CDC definition from the CDC, a product that stimulates a person's immune system to produce immunity to a specific disease, protecting that person from that disease. Now, the experimental current uh, trial endpoints from Moderna, Pfizer, J&J, &J, AstraZeneca have been, their endpoint has been to decrease disease severity and hospitalization. S sterilizing and neutralizing immunity have not been proven, and transmission, prevention of transmitting the virus, has not been proven. So you can answer the question up above. If you look at the definition from the CDC of what a vaccine is, does decreasing symptoms and not providing sterilizing or neutralizing immunity qualify? Just putting the question out there. Now, anyone that receives these shots, um, it is your body, your choice. In life, everything is a risk-benefit risk analysis. I'm not saying get it, don't get it. I just want people to be informed. If you're going to get it, it is your choice, but you should be fully informed. Anyone receiving the current emergency investigational vaccines that are emergency authorized, these are not approved nor licensed, you are enrolled for two years as an experimental subject in a large phase three trial. If injury or death occurs, you have by law no legal recourse against these companies. A vaccine trial, the fastest we've ever got a vaccine to the human market is the mumps vaccine, and that was four years to get that to the market. We've done this in nine months. A vaccine trial, usually for safety data purposes and long-term side effects, takes two to six years before final approval. This one is shooting for two years. None are currently authorized for children. Moderna, J&J, &J, age 18 and above. Pfizer, 16. I'll get to questions at the end. All right, how do these work? All right, we have never used mRNA for a vaccine on a large population ever in the history of humankind, okay? So what do we do? We take the virus, cut out the little piece of the RNA sequence that codes for the spike protein, put it in a lipid shell, put it in a vial at very, 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 very cold temperatures, put it into a syringe, inoculate into your arm, and these sequences are supposed to go into your cell, take over your cell machinery to replicate themselves, or replicate and make a spike protein that expresses itself on the sur surface of your cell. So you are now becoming that little antigen factory yourself, and you're making a part of the virus in your cell, puts it on the surface of your cell, and then your body is supposed to make an antibody against that foreign protein, the spike protein of the, of the COVID-19. Okay, so that's how J&J &J and Moderna work. How does J&J, &J, uh, or um, I'm sorry, that's how Pfizer and um, Moderna work. J&J &J is different. So what they do is they take a common cold virus and they knock out all the genes that would cause the cold out of that virus shell and they splice in a piece of DNA that codes for the spike protein of COVID, of SARS-CoV-2. They inject that, it goes into your cell, they gulp it in and then that little DNA unfolds it gets uh, transcribed into mRNA, then that makes the spike protein, puts it on the surf surface of your cell, and then your body says, okay, now I'm gonna make an antigen against that spike protein that's from that foreign virus. 
You're not getting the whole virus, it's making a part of the virus. Now, to some people this matters, and so I want to just make sure that this is a point of clarity. J&J, because people ask this question, I know it may come at the end. J&J is grown on retinal aborted fetal cells from a cell line in the 1980s. Per the FDA fact sheet that is in the J&J application and in the um, physician handouts, the J&J shot may contain 0.15 micrograms of human proteins and 3 nanograms of human DNA. That's for informational purposes. All right. Coronavirus vaccine safety concerns. All right, I, I've, I've talked about this before to, to some audiences. Antibody dependent enhancement reaction, immune priming. Now this is really interesting. So you may get an injection, and we know this happened in all the animal studies with the SARS virus, the MERS virus. In the MERS virus, ferrets, their lungs and their lung tissue and their immunity is very, very similar to humans. In the ferret model, 100% of the ferrets, when exposed to a wild-type virus down the road, ended up with severe immune reactions and a higher percentage of death in the vaccinated ferrets than those ferrets in the placebo group that were exposed to wild-type virus in that study. So basically, if you have a vaccine against the SARS or the MERS in the animal studies, months down the road, that there can be a severe immune reaction and death. Now, am I hoping these current injections do that? Absolutely not. I'm cheering for things to be safe. I'm just saying, historically, we need to know what has happened in the family of coronaviruses. There's a really interesting story in the Philippines with another virus called dengue fever, and this is a perfect example of why we need to be cautious moving forward, especially in children. Dengue fever, it's a tropical fever, very severe, causes severe illness, causes death in the tropics. In the Philippines, they did a trial many years ago, 800,000 uh, people um, got the dengue vaccine. And they're like, yay, next season, we're not gonna have so much dengue and disease amongst these children. Well, what happened the next season is viruses mutate. Coronaviruses mutate, dengue viruses mutate, viruses mutate. So the vaccines right now are for last year's Wuhan strain of the virus, okay? Going back to dengue. So what happened the next season when the virus mutated? There was an increase in hospitalization in those who had been vaccinated against dengue. There was more, 600 deaths, 600 deaths in the vaccinated group. The cure was worse than the disease. Now, there are 100,000 children in the Philippines carrying this antibody because they've been vaccinated. For the rest of their life, these 100,000 children are at higher risk every dengue fever season. This also happened in trials with the RSV virus, which we know little kids get. After, I don't know if it was three to five deaths in that trial, they actually stopped that vaccine. This same antibody-dependent enhancement reaction, you get exposed to an antibody through an inoculation, and a year later, or two years later, or three, we don't know is the honest answer scientifically. You are primed, you are primed, and again, I am hoping against all hope that this doesn't happen. But I think, again, risk, benefit in life, we have to make an informed choice. If you feel like you're at high risk and you need the inoculation, good, make an informed choice. That's your body and your choice. This is an important point. Um, right now, we know that SARS-CoV-2 is a rapidly spreading virus. By selecting for vaccines that do not induce true sterilizing immunity and only decrease symptoms against last year's variant, we may be selecting for faster replicating more virulent strains and actually increase the spread of COVID. We don't know yet, but watching the curves over the next couple months will be interesting. This is according to Geert Vandenbosch. He is a leading world vaccinologist, as pro-vaccine as you get. He has worked with all the world's organizations. He's called on the WHO and the world to halt all vaccines right now due to this risk. Um, interesting man to research, um, brilliant mind, a very, very brilliant scientist. All right, VAERS, we don't hear much about this. This is the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System from the CDC. So far, in the last three and a half months since these have been approved and been on the market and been inoculated into millions and millions and millions of Americans, we now have 30,000 adverse events reported and 1,174 deaths in three and a half months of use under investigation. 
A Harvard study showed that adverse events are historically significantly underreported. So you can probably multiply that many fold. All right, 20 countries, eight European countries in the last couple of days have halted the rollout of the Astra AstraZeneca vaccine after just 100 clotting incidents. Yet the above experimental injections so far, you see the data up there, have not been halted. Now, it's just, this is just a, a play in logic. You know, if there are 12 cribs that you know, break and a child falls and gets injured or dies, or a Firestone or Goodyear, who, whatever brand, I didn't mean to name any brands, whatever tire blows up you know, in 20 vehicles, or say you know, a car seat fails, how many of those does it happen until there's a complete safety product recall on the market? A handful, 10, 20? So it's fascinating to ponder this. You know, here we have, you know, again, is the cure worse than the disease? We don't know. We're making a calculated risk with people's lives in a population. So again, I'm just saying we need to be informed and are we thinking logically? All right, can an emergency authorized vaccine be mandated? No, no, it cannot. These are optional. Again, your body, your choice. I'm not anti-vaccine, I'm pro-safe vaccine. The investiga investigational trials are authorized for emergency use only by the FDA, and the trials are designed to last for two years to determine efficacy and safety. Again, their efficacy endpoint right now, when you hear it, they're 95% effective at decreasing one or two symptoms and severity of disease, not at sterilizing immunity. Have not been approved nor licensed by the FDA. These are optional. Fact sheets are required to be given to providers and patients. I have a physician colleague. He just got his inoculation. They didn't give him any. That's required by the FDA. If you're going and getting an inoculation for an investigational vaccine, they have to give you the fact sheet. You need to be informed. An informed consent in a trial. You are, you're a subject in a trial. You need full and informed consent. If you go into surgery, your surgeon always says to you, here's the risks, here's the complications, here's what we do know, here's what we don't know, but you're at risk and you need to know and have fully informed consent. This absolute, it's supposed to be happening. So if it's not happening where you are, make sure it is. At least that way, we're being honest with the public as a medical establishment. All right, investigational vaccines are not allowed to be mandatory. This applies to organizations, including hospitals. This is from the CDC's executive director, executive secretary of immunization policy. This is in federal mandate. You cannot be mandated to take this. An antibody may be forever, okay? Good thing most of us in this room, whether you know, grandma you know, got the polio or the measles vaccine, she still has a lovely antibody. That's why she still doesn't get measles. That's great, that's great. You know, a lot of vaccines are safe and work and provide immunity to pathogens for a lifetime. That's the goal. If it isn't a good one, there's no way to reverse it. This is the precautionary tale here. Now, when COVID started, we took the precautionary principle and said, um, we need to lock everything down, et cetera, and you know what happened. That was precautionary. I'm saying this is precautionary. If it's not a good antibody, it is an antibody you have forever. We don't know yet is the honest answer. What are the long-term safety data on this? None yet, okay? Informed consent. Do we need to uh, vaccinate children for a virus they survive at a statistical rate of essentially 100% with the risks that we know could happen down the road? This is just a hypothetical question to think about, not knowing what those long-term safety outcomes are. When we started these inoculations investigational, it was for the high risk group. If you feel like you're in that high risk group and you wanna be protected, great, your body, your choice. Then it went from high risk group to, well, let's give it to everybody. And now the trials are starting on children for something that statistically they survive at 100% and do great. So I'm just making sure, are we asking the right questions as a public? Conclusions, children do great against COVID-19 isn't that lovely? Isn't it beautiful? We love our children. I love my children. You love your children. Let's get them back to normal life. Let's not have them fear. 
children do great. All right, while vaccines are an incredibly important public health tool and have saved millions of lives over the years, in the current state of affairs, there are significant concerns for the which we need to have extreme caution, especially with our children. Investigational van mac uh, vaccines cannot be mandated. Those are my high points on COVID children, schools, uh, concept of vaccines. <laughs> and are there any questions? Yes, sir. So, I'm going to ask this kind of question. Uh, I, uh, a summarizing question. Okay, fire away. It's going to be kind of rhetorical because uh, I think I kind of already know the answer. But uh, bear with me while I uh, rest this from my memory. So, um, it doesn't provide sterilizing immunity. It does not, so, uh, yeah, it doesn't provide sterilizing immunity. So far, we have not proven that, it correct? It does not prevent or reduce transmission. It does not prevent or reduce transmission. So far, uh, science has not proven that. It uh, selects against a somewhat, perhaps, milder version of this virus. Well, virus, okay, it's selecting against viruses. So the virus replicates in about 10 hours. But does and not select against potentially more virulent viruses. Correct. So it does not. If, if, you, if you're attacking one strain, another strain may double quicker. Yes, exactly. It may select for, and that's what one of the world's preeminent vaccinologists, Geert Vandenbosch, Vandenbosch is saying, that we may be, and again, this is science and we're looking at it right now, it may be selecting for more quickly spreading and, and doubling variants, correct? So I'm counting fingers here, and that little half finger right here is it does prevent a couple of symptoms. Correct. And so if you do the so statistics... My, my rhetorical question uh, okay. is this. Why the heck should we take it? Well, and again, this is where, you know, I know the, a lot of people that are going to, you know, naysay me and whatnot, and that's why I'm trying to say, look, I, I, I believe in safe, proven vaccines, and so that's an excellent question. You know, why the heck take it? Again, freedom of choice, uh, being in an investigational study, that's your choice. If you feel like you're at high risk and will benefit from it and you've done your own personal risk-benefit analysis, that's fine. But to your last point there, if you look at the statistical analysis in the Pfizer, it would take 119 individuals to get both injections for one person to have a decrease in severity of one symptom. And, and yeah, and that's the ARR and the statistical, you know, if you look at the statistics of it, you scratch your head and go, wait a minute, they're saying this is 95% effective at decreasing symptoms from severe to moderate or moderate to mild, effective at that. But 119 people for one person to have a decrease in a symptom and not get sterilizing immunity per the study so far. Yes, sir. For us new students in the room, can you define sterilizing immunity? Absolutely. So when, when you're exposed to things, your immune system, all day long, pathogens come in and out of our bodies. We're exposed to everything. And, and your body is sampling it, saying, do I recognize that or not? Do I need to attack it? You know, that innate immune system will kick in at first. If it recognizes it as foreign and it wants to keep it out, uh, it tickles the immune system and, and it says to the immune system, okay, we need, to, we need to start forming an antibody against this in case we encounter it again. Now, when your immune system does that to one pathogen, you may form hundreds of antibodies. Of those, maybe 10 or 12 bind super tightly to it, and those are the sterilizing neutralizers. It's like a lock and a key. They sterilize and neutralize. They bind the little Y on that antibody, or on that antibody binds to that protein on that invader. And if it's sterilizing, they bind tightly. Your Pac-Man, your macrophage cells come and gobble it up and you know, take out the trash. So to have sterilizing immunity, you need to form a strong antibody that 100% of the time binds to that foreign invader. And so if you have a virus that's mutating, those antibodies may not bind as tightly and may not send that signal to gobble it up. So in order to have sterilizing or neutralizing immunity, by the CDC definition, if you give a vaccine, it has to provide immunity. And that's that neutralizing immunity. It's that little antibody binding every time to that proper lock and key and saying, all right, we can clear this. We're not going to make this person sick because our antibody can bind it and kick it out the door. Yes, sir. Can you talk for a minute on 
this spike protein that's created, how the immune system is going to continue to recognize that as a foreign invader to lead to future autoimmune That's an excellent question. So the question is, spike protein, will our body recognize it as potentially a foreign invader? Can it cause autoimmune disease? You know, the answer is, there's something in biology called molecular mimicry. The spike protein is very similar to another protein in our body called syncytion. We have syncytion in our brain. It can be in the uterus, the placenta, the testes, other tissues in the body. Sometimes when you have a protein present, you'll get a cross-reaction. So even though that antibody wants to be binding against that spike, it may go, oh, this looks like the spike, and it may bind to your own cells as well. Now, the spike in some studies, it took 55 wells of different parts of human tissue, and that spike binds to the surface of about 28 different human tissues. So once this spike is in circulation, it may stick to this cell or stick to that cell or this organ or that organ in your body. The honest answer is we don't know how much autoimmune disease we're going to see down the road. Uh, the answer is probable based on previous studies, absolutely. Previous coronavirus studies, previous other, um, other virus studies, um, yeah, autoimmunity can have happen post inoculation. That's an excellent question. Thank you. I see him. Wanna... Oh, yes, please. I'll get back to your side. <laughs> okay. Why the second shot? Yes. What are we doing to educate our physicians, our nurse practitioners, and our other healthcare providers in the future? Okay, why the second shot? Because one shot doesn't boost your immune response strong enough. Now, there's one reason I talked about this in a previous talk. In order to form a good antibody against any invader, you need high vitamin D, normal vitamin D levels. You know, I talked in my last talk how deficient the world is in vitamin D levels. Master key to your immune system. In order for your T cells come along first and tickle the pathogen, and then they go talk to the B cells and say, hey, this is what we found. Here's a piece of it. Will you start making an antibody to it? So that, that plasma cell, that B cell, then starts making the antibodies. If your vitamin D levels are low, you don't have enough of those CD4 T cells to talk to that, to that D cell. Well, here we are vaccinating at the end of a winter when 70 to 80% of Americans are deficient in vitamin D because most people don't supplement and should with some vitamin K2, magnesium as well, long, long talk there. But if, if you are immune suppressed because of your lowered immune function in the winter time, then you don't form as strong of an antibody. So you have to think when we're doing some of these trials and in the populations, I mean, these were the trials originally were done in young, healthy people. So, you know, it's a different ball game. So you may get a set immune response, but it, take, it took two to get a bigger boost. And again, I hypothesize a lot of that is because we don't emphasize the importance of pro-hormone, a natural part of your human body, vitamin D. We don't have enough of it in our population, so we, we tend to have a poor immune response. So that's, that's part of the reason why. It, it just didn't provide enough uh, reaction. And again, it still didn't provide a sterilizing immunity even after the second shot so far. So it's not neutralizing the virus 100% of the time because if you get, if you get COVID, you can still, or you get the injection, you can still get COVID. And we've seen that time and time and time again in the news and in the stories. Yes, ma'am. Second question, don't forget the second question. Oh, the second. Um, well, um, that's a good question. You know, that's up to the public health agencies. Um, you know, I'm speaking my little part, but again, I want informed consent on anything we do in life. Um, again, your body, your choice, be informed. That's, okay, so the question is about my natural immunity and a natural infection and taking care of my immune health versus getting an inoculation. Um, when you get a natural infection, you form hundreds and hundreds of antibodies. So not just against this little S1 tip of the spike, but S1, the S2, the nuclear protein, the envelope, the membrane, the capsid. So you have this whole broad, broad array of antibodies against uh, future infection. So you have you know, potentially tens and tens and tens of these sterilizing, neutralizing, binding, wipe it out kind of antibodies. So once you've had the infection, uh, you're, in SARS and MERS, we know you at least for two to three years had immunity against infection again. 
the T cell memory lasted up to 17 years. Okay, and that's why a lot of us with the previous coronaviruses, not only because of your antibodies, remember that innate immune system, I probably skipped over a slide, there's a bunch of things you can do to boost your innate immune system. You know, exercise, sleep, adequate vitamin D, C, curcumin, and other supplements. Um, yeah, I don't know if you can go back to that one real quick. So boosting your natural immune response will, will give you, um, uh, yeah, there you go. That was the one. Um, will give you a stronger immune system and have you more primed and prepared to fight off anything. Adequate sleep, a healthy non-inflammatory diet, we eat too much sugar, processed foods, fats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Decrease your stress, hard this year, I know, for all of us. Massages help. Meditation or a contemplative prayerful practice, whatever your thing is, calming the mind is important. It increases your natural killer cells. Walking in nature, being outside, forest bathing in Japan is what they call it, increases your natural killer cells. You know, avoiding alcohol in excess. We know that 400% of liquor sales have gone up this year in some regions, et cetera. Avoiding opioids, THC, inflammatory diet. Do what you can to decrease obesity, um, insulin resistant, all things you can do to boost how your immune system is primed to fight off anything, not just COVID. All right, I'm getting a lot of them here. And I will, after, I don't want to take time. I know Representative Moon, it's her turn. So I will stay afterward and answer any questions for as long as you need me to. I'm, I'm happy to answer those additional questions. But it Dr. is. Cole, you take this I will. Her, her arm was all, I kept on bouncing. Thank you. You can't spell dad without ADD or ADD without dad, so. Uh, in pregnancy. Yes. The question is about the placenta, pregnancy, um, vaccine. Um, the honest answer is we don't know. Um, when you're pregnant, the placenta upregulates a ton of the ACE2 receptor. It is primed to bind the spike protein. Now, if you get the spike protein in circulation, it will certainly bind to it. The injections say, do not get pregnant for two months afterwards. And that protein I talked about, that molecular mimic, that spike looks like in our own body, syncytion, that is highly upregulated on the placenta. So the honest answer is, we don't know. But we do know that the risk for COVID in children is essentially zero. Again, some have passed. That's sad, it's tragic. But statistically, out of 74 million children in the United States, so in order to protect those babies, do we need to be putting the mom at risk for something where we don't know the answer yet? The answer is, I don't know. But at least that's what the data shows. We don't know. Thank you. you bet. Thank you. And thank you so much for the opportunity again. Thank you. Wow, we love him. He's wonderful. <laughs> Um, uh, so we've got a couple of updates. Uh, uh, Carrie Hanks, Representative Hanks, is here. She's uh, brought a bill forward that uh, prohibits any mask mandates in the state of Idaho. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they got it. Uh, she got it out of state affairs, and uh, we just had it on the floor. And she's going to tell you what happened to it there. But we're still going to need your support once it comes over to the Senate side. So, Representative Hanks. I'm trying not to be emotional. <laughs> um, I was so excited today to present this bill prohibiting mask mandates. So many of us cannot or will not wear masks. And it's a personal right. It's a personal choice. And um, so it was really frustrating today. But what happened was in this legislation, um, there's a little just a little thing that needs to be added. It's no problem at all, um, just to clarify. And then the other part that we have to add, which a, a lot of us probably didn't know about, but we have to add, besides excluding the hospitals and healthcare facilities, we have to add the courts. Um, I know. Yes. I know. Oh. 
Well, and the way it was explained to me, that's why I was kind of late getting here. I wish I could have been here for Dr. Cole's presentation. But um, so in the Constitution, the courts have jurisdiction over their, over their courtroom. And so um, I asked, well, then what happens if somebody can't wear a mask? And I mean, much less that we don't feel that we should constitutionally. But um, he just said that uh, you can get a waiver from the judge, so good luck with that. I hope that works. Um, but that's, that's where we are in that. So, um, so we started the debate. It had to go to amending order. And um, they're, they're working with me. The leadership's working with me to get it through again. So um, as, in fact, as soon as I leave here, I've got to get the information in so we can get it switched. And I, I think it'll be up again, at least in the amending order tomorrow. Um, so many of us don't know exactly how all this works, even if we're in the legislature. So, but towards the end of the session, everything kind of changes. So we, the, everything, the, kind of the rules and everything. Yeah. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll quickly get through here. Um, but I appreciate so much your support and, and how, I mean, I'm passionate about this. In our State Affairs Committee, we had a psychologist who talked about women and children, and children includes boys. <laughs> it seems like we focus on women a lot, but, but that have um, been victimized, raped, whatever, you know, these serious, serious, um, traumatizing things that have happened to these people and to ask them or demand that they wear a mask is just not going to happen. I, I have a friend that told me right up front, she said, I will not wear a mask because of something. Um, you, know what I'm uh, you know what I'm alluding to. <laughs> And so, um, also, it, it is a personal choice in our Constitution. I have it ready to go on the floor. If anybody asks, um, I have articles right in the Constitution that I will talk about. What's your bill number? Right? Uh, three, 339. Sorry, we had to switch it. So, um, so the last thing I just wanted to say, um, so you probably all have uh, something you could tell us about people that have to wear masks or the, the silly things. I had COVID a year ago. I just checked my Red Cross. Um, uh, they do the test when you, when you give blood and I still have the antibodies. I'm sure you can't see them, but I have them. <laughs> um, so I, and I was just told that in one of our small districts, a school board member is making those kids wear masks. They don't have any cases, maybe one in the whole county and, and that's my challenge, or that's my problem with all this too, is that those of us who've had it, why do we, I mean, common sense just says you don't have to wear the mask if you've already had it. You don't have to have the genetic mod modulation or the vaccine, whatever you want to call that. If you've already had it, it, it just makes no sense. So, um, <laughs> thanks, I'm glad I'm, I'm glad I know, I'm glad I'm with the doctor on this because you're amazing, so. Um, so anyway, um, I guess, do we have time for a question? Okay. Oh, let's let this gentleman and then I'll get you. Can you please address the private property? When I go to a restaurant that's open to the public, and I try to order food, and I see you need to wear a mask, and I say, I, sorry, I have a health-related condition, I say, oh, well, this is private property, it's our call. Uh, no, it's not. You lease from them. But can you address that? And also things like corporate. Like, I go to Trader Joe's, and I say, oh, it's a corporate policy. I know. So I don't even, um, what's the word? I, I know I am not anywhere near an expert on this, but, you know, private property, if they say no shirt, no shoes, no service, that's where you are on it. Um, they, they have the right to conduct their business. Um, as far as corporate, I know one of my friends has been into um, Trader Joe's, and often they don't even, the, the employees don't even know the exact uh, policy. We, we went into a restaurant and she said it's a state law that you have to wear a mask. And, <laughs> and, and, 
and I, I won't say which legislator I was with, but, but um, I said, well, I'm a state legislator, and I know that it is not a state law. And the state legislator, the other one was going, don't do that. They'll spit, I, maybe I shouldn't say that. Just, they said, when they're, when they're taking care of your food, you want to be nice. <laughs> so, I'm not trying to demean any food servers, but I, I thought, point well taken. So, um, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. I've heard differently about that, the no shirt, no. Okay. So there's these handicap laws. So it's only yep. handicapped and not to have a ramp. So yep. it's the same thing for the mask. So if the people can't wear them, they still have to accommodate because they are open to the public. That's right. Yeah. Costco is just membership. Yep. Not someone's open to the public. They have to accommodate because, of course, the science is not. Open. So it's like the ADA. Right. Yeah. But for yeah. some reason, this just seems to have thrown our world into chaos, so. Um, one more question. Yeah, I just, my, my point is about the uh, courts. My understanding is our taxpayer dollars uh, go to the court system. So yeah. I, I am absolutely at my maximum frustration, taxpayer dollars that are funding a lot of these institutions, yeah. and they are making rules um, not in accordance with what we the people want. How do yeah. we fix that then? Because then I go, I don't want my tax dollars supporting our government-funded schools. I don't want my tax dollars going to fund the courts yeah. then. If they're going to dictate, how, and you can maybe answer this, how do we take our, our power back? I'm, fi I'm done. I'm right. so fed up. Well, yeah. <laughs> And, and this is a big part of how we do this. Um, we have to have many, many more, but it's so cool because every, every week I come here, there's more people here, and, and I always put on Facebook, so I'm, I'm hoping that those, yeah, that, that um, are interested, and we just, we need to bring it in and just get more people engaged and angry in a good way, <laughs> and like, I guess indignant is yeah. maybe better than angry, is just indignant that, that they can do this. But apparently, I didn't have time to look at it because they just told me, but it's apparently in the Constitution, in our Idaho Constitution, that it lays out the courts. So, so we need I, to change that, right? Apparently. That. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, maybe, where can we find out where that is? Article 5, Section 13. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hank. She's always great. Okay, um, I was going to have Representative Steve Harris. He's the chairman of Revenue Taxation Committee, uh, Revenue and Taxation Committee, and uh, we just passed a bill in the House, House uh, Bill 332. And if you were noticing this on the news, I don't even know if they covered it because it was good news. Uh, that. <laughs> They only cover the bad stuff we do. But anyway, um, uh, as far as income tax rates uh, being uh, decreased across the board, uh, there's going to be a tax relief fund, and there's also going to be a small one-time income tax rebate. He was going to come talk to you about that and the brackets and all, all of that, but it is at least some form of income tax relief. Most of us, I won't say most, but a good majority of us would have liked to have seen a bigger tax relief uh, coming your way, at least with the grocery sales tax repeal. We were sure hoping for that, but um, uh, we're awash with money, and for some reason we just can't seem to get it back in your pocket, and that's very upsetting to a lot of us. So uh, Representative Harris will not be here, and I'm very sorry about that. Um, uh, on another note, uh, Lieutenant Governor McGeehan has something to report on uh, that just happened in the Senate. It's always exciting to see if something happens in the Senate. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Moon. And actually, there are two bills in the Senate that I wanted to report on just the other day. And this is one of the very important promises that the legislators made to the, you, you all, the citizens, to uh, provide an ability for the legislature to call itself back into special session. That bill, and it is a constitutional amendment, it did pass out of the Senate. It's on the floor side. I'm not sure where it's at on the floor side, but I'm trusting that there's no problem with that on the floor side. But just the other day, the accommodating language to, it, the constitutional amendment is written sort of broadly, and then they have to follow that up with language that's more specific and, and details out that process a little more. Well, that bill, it was Senate Bill 1112, 
It did pass the Senate, but the interesting thing about that bill is that 23 voted for it and 12 voted against it. What's important about that is that that represents a, a, a number that would not sustain a governor's veto. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to remain confident that these things will be successful over on the House side, and that when the, the resolution doesn't need the governor's signature, but the bill will. And so I will remain hopeful that everybody has worked all these things out and it will go into effect. So that's a really important promise that the lawmakers made to, to you all, all of us as, as a citizen. And then today there was a bill, 1108, which was a bill to put some restraints on the local budgets and in an effort to also work to curtail the growth of local property taxes. And it was a, it was modest to uh, a modest increase a modest reduction in the ability of those local budgets to grow, and that bill failed on the on the Senate floor today. And so, uh, it, property tax is a huge issue. Until people wake up and realize that your property tax is always a function of the spending in those budgets, we will never be able to solve that problem. So I'm, dis I'm disappointed, even though it was a modest change, it failed in the Senate. And I don't know of any other, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later today, any other bill dealing directly with property tax increase. So those are a couple of bill updates. Next week, we, we're wrapping up our legislative session. From what I hear, the lawmakers are wanting to wrap up by the end of next week. And so next week will be our last capital clarity. And I wanted to end on a positive note. And so we're going to have a, a message from an inspirational speaker, a gentleman that's going to be here and tell us his story in life, a gentleman that I met during this process, this capital clarity process. So uh, please come back next week. It will be our last one uh, in, in person. And um, if you come out next week, I'll also have a small gift for you if you come out. <laughs> and let's see. So I do have, I wanted to mention this session that we've had every week. This is our 10th week, and it's been, um, We've, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope that it's been helpful to keep you involved and know what's going on. And it's really only because of your interest and your attention that this has been so successful. So I want to thank you for that. And I have a special announcement to make. If does, do you have the? I do. So, starting today, and again, as a, as a cause of this being such a successful effort, starting today, we are taking Capital Clarity to the radio. And um, so every Thursday at 5, we will be hosted by KBOI 670 and keep you all involved in this legislative in this process what happens in state government even after the legislative session adjourns so from the bottom of our hearts we want to thank you for your support of our effort okay, thank you. <laughs> Tina do you I mentioned you guys, and I, if there's interest, um, and I've talked with um, Dustin about it, I'm trying to continue some format for um, an educational process like this, maybe a weekend evening, once a month. I don't know. I mean, I would, I would help put it together, get speakers, but I would like to see where we can delve even deeper into the use of the website, the process of bills, how we reach out to our representatives, um, how Idaho Freedom Foundation does their index scoring, how they look at a bill and, and, and um, explain to us how they come up with those scores. I just went to my first um, the meeting with the Republican committee. I had no idea how that process even worked. 
delving into this whole process of government and how we're represented and how we can get more involved. Because uh, I think people right now are hungry and with the success we've had here. And so I'm just putting a plea out. If we could do something, I am available to assist in any way. And I think there's interest. I think people, I have talked to people today. <laughs> Well, Tina, I'd like to invite you to be one of our first guests on Capital Clarity. <laughs> and we welcome your, your help and your assistance. Daniel. One reason, <clears throat> donate to good conservatives' uh, campaigns. That's number one. And number two, I have a question. Um, whatever happened to uh, Senate Bill 1110, the initiatives, uh, did that ever get uh, uh, settled? Well, it, yeah, it's over on the House side, and I don't know what's going on over there. She, what's it, Representative Moon, what did you say? It's on the House side, and it should be coming up uh, maybe tomorrow. Did it go through the committee process, and it's going to be on the... I think it's on the third reading calendar. Okay, so you could um, message, reach out to all of your state representatives for if they'll be voting on the floor maybe tomorrow, tomorrow or... Monday. Today's Thursday already. I want to also a special thank you to Daniel, who's been the one that has been taking so many wonderful photographs of, of the presenter. So thank you for, for doing that. It's very nice. A question. Could you please uh, let us know what is the most important bill that has been passed and is on the governor's desk for signature? Oh. Uh. There, somebody, can, Fred, can you help me with this? There, I, I asked for a compilation of all the, to me, some of the, mo, the most, I mean, this is just me speaking, but I think the most important bills are the ones that dealt with what we di li lived with last year, with the, the orders, the emergency orders, the shutdowns, and the, and the uh, restrictions on our, our right to worship in our businesses. To me, those are the most important bills. And I asked for a compilation of all the bills in relation to that. And it's a list of about 40 or 50 bills. And as of a few days ago, only two of them had made it to the governor's desk, had not been signed yet. One of them had made it through both bodies, but um, but things have moved a little bit since then. But I, I just I, I I apologize. I don't have that list in front of me. Otherwise, I could go right to it. If anybody knows, um, does this work? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, the only bill that uh, falls under the emergency order, and I think I mentioned it before, is that the public health districts cannot tell schools, school boards, how yeah, to right. take care of their kids with another epidemic, pandemic, or whatever you want to call it. So that passed, and also that the State Board of Education will be the uh, one who will decide what happens at the university and college level. So that's good, because that means it's not the public health district closing down schools. It's going to be the uh, State Board of Education. Those are the only two in regard to the emergency order that have been signed into law. But where everything else is at, um, there hasn't been too many bills signed into law. Uh, GPS. Uh, G Touching a GPS unit, if you're an Uber driver, that was the first one to go through. Um, so uh, as far as the emergency order, that's the only one that's done for so far. Okay, so it's, we're past the hour, and so I'll wrap this up. But before I do, I wanted to, again, recognize people. Um, a very special person that's here today is my husband, Jim McGeehan. <laughs> I also want to recognize there, I know that there is a, a county commissioner that's here, Rod Beck. There, okay, he was here. We do have a candidate for attorney general, Art Mackenber, who's here. And I did see Raul Labrador. Thanks for being here. And so all the other elected officials, the representatives or senators, if you're here, please stand and let everyone recognize you and, and express your appreciation for being here.
And with that, stay tuned, 5 o'clock, 670 KBOI tonight, and then we'll see you next week. Thank you.